Friends, if you would, I would ask that you would join with me in the Gospel of John, please. The Gospel of John, in the third chapter. And you can hear my son in the balcony. He is ready to preach this morning. So I should just hand him the mic and get out of the way. Third chapter of John, very familiar passage that we all probably have memorized. Today we are going to try to break it down and understand the context in which Jesus said these most famous words. Start with me in the 14th verse, if you would please. John chapter 3, and we will be reading verses 14 through 17. Amen. Amen. And when you have it, say amen. And if you do not, simply avert your eyes to the screens. Beginning at the 14th verse, the New Revised Standard Translation reads as follows. And just as Moses lifted up the servant in the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order the world might be saved through him. Amen. Friends, as a thesis verse this morning, I want to focus in on the 17th verse. Underline these words in your Bible, please. Indeed, God did not, the line, did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Friends, with the help of your prayers and under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, we want to speak to you briefly this morning on the subject of the flexibility of Jesus. The flexibility of Jesus. Jesus. Many of us don't even remember how small we were when we memorized John 3.16. It was potentially by either Sunday school or early Christian school, it was the first verse that you were called to memorize. You memorized it from the King James Version, and I don't care who you are or where you are, if told to stop on a dime and quote John 3.16. You might not know another verse in all of Scripture, but everybody knows John 3.16. They don't know what Jesus was talking about at the time he said it. They don't know where Jesus was. No context. But if you ask a random person in the street to tell you John 3.16, whether they're Christian or not, chances are they can quote John 3.16. I know people, I have friends who never go to church. Church is just not their thing. In fact, they are sleeping right now, and in an hour or two, they will get up and go to brunch. And they can quote John 3, 16. They don't know where John is in the Bible, but they can quote John 3, 16. John 3, 16 is quite literally referred to as the verse. It is the verse. You should know that the reason why you're a Sunday school teacher when you were small, or your preacher, or your Christ, early Christian education teacher, the reason why they had you memorize this verse is because in one verse, the author encapsulates the entire gospel for why you should serve Jesus Christ. The entire gospel can be boiled down. I could break the entire gospel down to you out of this one verse. And this is why it is commonly referred to as the verse. It is the most important verse people say in all of Scripture. It argues against Psalm 100, Psalm 23. These are important verses that we all have memorized, but I think you would agree with me. John 3.16 is number one, right? It's the number one most recognized verse. But what people tend to forget is not the verse, but it's the verse after the verse. It's the verse after the verse that makes the verse so important. It is the fact that God did not send the Son, Jesus, into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. 
I will never argue against the verse, but I am arguing for the verse after the verse. The John 3.17 gives John 3.16 its power. The fact that Jesus was not sent to condemn, but that Jesus was sent to save. And so to really get a sense of what this verse means today, and I want to put the entire chapter 3 in context for you today, you really got to start with what does it mean to condemn? What does it mean that someone or something is condemned? You see, in our English language, when we think of condemnation, we think first of buildings. This is an actual picture taken one block over from my grandmother's house in Baltimore City, where they are slowly but surely condemning houses, right? These homes have been condemned, the residents moved out, and the city is knocking them down and building up fancier technology, tech fancier homes. My grandmother, however, is like a tree planted by the river. You can condemn my house, but I shall not be moved. Mary McConnell versus Baltimore City. We will see who will win. My vote is on Mary McConnell. We think of buildings being condemned. We think of prisoners being condemned. Persons who have committed crimes and have been sent to jail. To live in our society right now is to know that undocumented persons in this country who have come from other countries so-called illegal immigrants, which is an improper term, so we will call them undocumented persons. To call someone an illegal Im immigrant is to think about the fact that if you've ever committed a crime, like gotten a speeding ticket, that makes you illegal. To be an immigrant means you were not here in the first place, so the only people who have a right to say they were here in the first place were the Native Americans. And since I've gotten a speeding ticket and I was brought over here with not any papers, I too would be an illegal immigrant. So the more appropriate term is to call them undocumented persons. Undocumented persons in this country are condemned. Persons of different religious ideologies. Oftentimes in this nation, if you do not believe what we believe, if you do not think how we think, you can be condemned. Persons who do not dress the way that we dress. You see persons walking around with a burqa, we immediately get scared and get nervous. Those persons oftentimes in this country are condemned. Persons who believe in uh, white supremacy, neo-Nazi-ish ways of thinking versus and over and against persons who would stand for the Black Lives Matter movement here in Charlottesville. Each group would, I believe, condemn the other group. We live in a country and in a society where condemnation is all around us. Everyone is condemning someplace else. Everyone, well, not everyone. Everybody doesn't believe in condemning other people, but I digress. C condemnation is so prevalent in our society that we even condemn ourselves. We look internally at ourselves and we, we hold ourselves accountable. We beat ourselves down. We condemn ourselves for the things that we do or the things we don't have or the things we're not doing right. We are constantly condemning ourselves. And it's easy to condemn yourself when you live in a society where you see condemnation all around you. You realize that condemnation is just a part of who you are until you read John 3, 17. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved through him. When you read that verse, you start thinking about buildings, you start thinking about prisoners, you start thinking about undocumented persons, you start thinking about persons who don't dress like we do, persons who have different religious ideologies, you start thinking about neo-Nazis and white supremacists and Black Lives Matter, and you realize we're doing something wrong. All this condemnation that is going on, the crux of our faith, the verse after the verse speaks against condemnation. The verse after the verse would argue there ought to be no condemnation. And Paul picks up on this idea when you go to Romans chapter 8 in the first verse. He says, therefore now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. With scripture, the book by which our lives are based upon, if the book consistently speaks against condemnation. And you and I live in a society where condemnation is everywhere around us, where we are consistently condemning people. We're consistently pushing others down. 
you must realize, friends, that we've got to fight against this spirit. This spirit is so evil and so prevalent in our society, it is so natural in us to condemn others that this is an anti-Christ spirit. It does not fit with what you and I are taught in Holy Scripture. Condemnation does not fit in what Jesus is speaking about here in the third chapter of John. This is Jesus speaking. For those of you who have read letter Bibles, if you look down, these words are in red. Our Holy Savior is the one who said, I wasn't sent into the world to condemn it. I was sent that the world might be saved. So for this to really make sense to us, we've got to put it in context. What was the context in which Jesus said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have eternal life. I haven't read the King James Version in 20 years, and I still have the King James Version memorized. John 3.16. What was the context in which Jesus said these words? Because I think once you and I understand the context in which Jesus said the words of John 3.16, it'll make the idea of no condemnation in Christ Jesus, it will make it make so much more sense. So you should know that in John chapter 3, Jesus was having a conversation with a man named Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He was in the religious ecclesiastical elite of the day. He was amazed by all that Jesus was doing. He was absolutely just enthralled with Jesus, but he was unwilling to follow Jesus because of his Jewish religious training. So the Bible says that Nicodemus came to Jesus at night to ask him a question. So you must go back to the first verse in chapter 3 in the Gospel of John to get the context in which the conversation flows all the way through to the 16th verse. And if you go back to the beginning of the conversation, it starts like this. There was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Other translations say no one can see the kingdom of God without being born again. Nicodemus is confused by Jesus' statements. What do you mean I must be born again? He says, can I enter a second time into my mother's womb? Jesus, continuing on in the conversation, says pretty much, you call yourself a Pharisee, you call yourself a one of the elite of the Jewish people. You call yourself a religious leader, but you don't understand this simple thing that I'm saying. You must be born again, born of water and of spirit. He's talking about the idea of regeneration, the fact that you must be born again. He's pretty much saying you have to start over. You have to wipe the slate clean on everything that you think and everything that you believe, and you have to let the Holy Spirit build in you a new way of thinking and a new way of being. If you want to enter the kingdom of God, he's letting the Pharisee know you must be born again. He would say in our society today, you must recognize that you were born and shaped in a society that is all about condemnation. You, you were born and shaped in a society that condemns others. It is natural in your spirit to condemn your neighbor, to condemn your family member, to condemn others. But if you want to have a part in who I am, if you want to be a disciple of mine, if you want to enter the kingdom of God, you must Throw out everything you think you know, everything you think you believe. You must be regenerated. You have to be born again. You should know that Jesus saying this in conversation with Nicodemus is what many scholars have called one of the controversial sayings of Jesus. It is controversial because Jesus is pretty much saying, you don't know anything, Pastor Williams. You don't know anything, deacon or, or member. You must be born again. Born again. You must go back to the mind of a babe where you haven't learned anything and start from the beginning. Allow me to teach you. And in that teaching, you must be willing to say no to condemnation. 
in that teaching. I'm going to wipe the slate clean of you. I'm going to give you a Holy Spirit. And you must recognize that you have no right to condemn yourself because I do not condemn you. You have no right to condemn your neighbor because I do not condemn you. You have no right to condemn even your president because I do not condemn you. It's a new way of thinking. It, it boggles the mind. It stresses out our heart to think that we have to start over and not condemn others. This is natural to who we are. We do it so naturally that we won't even think that we're condemning others. We don't even think that that is in our nature, but it is. It's so much in our nature that he tries to give an example to Nicodemus for how no condemnation ought to make sense. And so the example is where we pick up in our reading. Remind you, the conversation is still going on between Jesus and Nicodemus. He's just said you must be born again. And then he says in the 14th verse, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. You see, Jesus was a voracious reader of scripture. He knew all of the scripture. So what Jesus is doing is he's giving us an example out of the Old Testament to help make his point in the New Testament. Just as Moses, was li just as Moses lifted up the serpent is a reference to the book of Numbers. There in the book of Numbers, chapter 21, you'll find a very interesting story. It's a story of the children of Israel having left Egyptian bondage, marching through the wilderness on their way to Canaan. They haven't quite yet made it to Canaan. They don't enter the promised land until the book of Joshua. But in the 21st chapter of the book of Numbers, they come up against a Canaanite army. The Canaanite army soundly defeats the children of Israel. So defeated are they that they go before the Lord and they say, help us, God. Why should we die here in the wilderness? Fight for us that we might defeat the Canaanite army. And when you keep reading there in the 21st chapter, you find that God hears their prayer and God defeats the Canaanite army on their behalf. They defeat the Canaanite army. They keep moving through the wilderness, but they get a little big for their britches. They begin to speak against Moses. They begin to speak against being in the wilderness and they forget what God had just done for them and allowing them to defeat the Canaanite army. So God says, if you want to forget about me, I'll let some things happen to you. So God allows serpents in the wilderness to come upon the people. Mind you, they're marching through what you can think about was kind of like an Amazon rainforest. And, and the serpents that are poisonous come upon the children of Israel and they begin to bite the children of Israel. And every person that gets bitten dies. They get bitten by a snake, die. They get bitten by a snake, die. So of course the children of Israel do exactly what they did when they were losing to the Canaanite army. They go back to God. And so starting at verse 7 in Numbers chapter 21, the Bible says, the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned. In other words, God, we did it again. We are so sorry. We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and speaking against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses intercedes on behalf of the people. And scripture says Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, make a poisonous serpent, set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. In the ninth verse, so Moses made a serpent of bronze, put it upon a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. The penalty of sin is death. The children of Israel were receiving the penalty for their sin of speaking against Moses and speaking against God. The serpents had come and were biting them and they were dying. But God did not send Jesus into the world to condemn the world. But that the world might be saved through him. So even before there was ever a Jesus, God could not handle his people being condemned. And so when the people repented and prayed unto God, God allowed his grace to come forward in the 21st chapter. He tells Moses, if you take a serpent and put it up on a pole and you hold it in the air, every bitten person who was about to die, every condemned person who was about to go down, if they simply gaze at the serpent, they will live. The story 
is intended to help you draw a parallel between the serpent on the pole and Jesus on the cross. I apologize that the pictures here are only of European persons. I've told you a million times that Jesus nor Moses were European, but this is the only picture I could find. So roll with me on this one. If I look at the serpent on the pole, I am no longer condemned, I am saved. If I look at the cross that is behind me and I believe in what Jesus did for me, I am no longer condemned, but I am saved. And so the point that Jesus is making in his conversation with Nicodemus there in the 14th verse, and just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And giving that context, he then says, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. If you believe in him, just like if you look at the serpent on the pole, you shall not perish, you shall not be condemned, but you shall have eternal life. If you believe, shall have eternal life. So the question Jesus is really asking Nicodemus in the conversation is, yes, John 3.16 is important, but the real question I'm asking you is, what do you believe? What is it that you believe? And so Jesus, because he doesn't want Nicodemus to get confused, and he doesn't want you and I to get confused, he quite literally in the very next verse tells Nicodemus what he should believe. You should believe that God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. You ought to believe in no condemnation. You ought to believe that everyone has an opportunity to be saved. This is the crux of our gospel. This is the crux of what you and I believe. This is the crux of what it means to be a Christian. Your family member ought not be condemned, but they have an opportunity to be saved. Your crazy co-worker ought not be condemned, but they have an opportunity to be saved. Your, your, your lunacy of your neighbor ought not be condemned, but they have an opportunity to be saved. Your president ought not be condemned, but they have an opportunity to be saved. Your spouse, your child, your pastor, the person in your church ought not be condemned. But they have an opportunity to be saved. This is what it means to be a Christian. That we stand in judgment of no one. That we stand in condemnation of no one. But rather just like our Savior came into the world, not to condemn it, but to save it. So too, as a disciple of Jesus, have I been sent into your life, not to condemn you, but to help save you. This is how you should feel when dealing with your family members. I haven't been sent to condemn you. I've been sent to help save you. This is how you should feel with the people that you work with. I haven't been sent to this job to condemn you, but to help save you. This is how you ought to feel with the people that you interact with who work your last nerve. I have not been sent to condemn you. I haven't been sent to talk bad about you. I haven't been sent to kick you while you're down and to push you away. But I have been sent into your life the same way Jesus was sent into this world, not to condemn, but to save. It is then that you recognize that what it's going to take to save my soul might be different than what it's going to take to save your soul. Might be different than what it's going to take to save your neighbor's soul. But everyone has an opportunity to be saved. The prisoner who was condemned by our society has an opportunity to be saved. My undocumented brothers and sisters who were condemned by our society because of what I read in scripture have an opportunity to be saved. Brothers and sisters who religiously may believe different things than I do, they have an opportunity to be saved. People who dress differently than I do, they have an opportunity to be saved. My brothers and sisters who don't think like I do and maybe hate me because of the color of my skin, they still have an opportunity to be saved. Even some Someone I didn't vote for, who ideologically I disagree with, even he has an opportunity to be saved. And if all those people have an opportunity to be saved, so do you. 
indeed, God did not send Jesus into the world to condemn it. He sent Jesus into the world that the world might be saved. Jesus is how salvation begins. The church is how salvation shall continue. Salvation for one will look different than salvation for another. Look, will look different than salvation for another. Jesus is capable. He's telling Nicodemus, I'm capable of doing whatever it takes to save everybody. And that's how you get the flexibility of Jesus. God bless you, brother.